I've changed the title slightly. It, it's it dawned on me in the last week or so that we are now facing a crucial uh, moment in the history of AI and architecture, a moment that I want to refer to as architecture's Sputnik moment. And hopefully that will be, become clear as I, I go through my presentation today. There are three areas, I think, where we already are noticing something new is happening. Firstly, the world of publications. This is something, a book that I published in December 2021. Um, it actually is listed as 22, and it came out in the States in 2022. Um, and alongside that, uh, uh, some, uh, there's this book, uh, The a Issue of AD, that I'm guest editing with Matthias Del Campo that will come out in June of this year. And in fact, there is a deluge of books that are going to appear this year on AI and architecture. These are just some of them, and they will all be coming out in the first half of this year. It's clear that something is happening in terms of publications. Alongside that, uh, um, and this is a further publication I'll be working on um, as part of this, this the, the, uh, uh, follow-up to the, my first book. The actual title is called The Death of the Architect, The, the Demise of, the, of Ar the Architectural Profession in the Age of AI. And I think I'll try, want to try and illustrate the threat in some senses about a, a, that AI presents because it is so capable. It's not because it's inherently evil or anything. It's, it's just very, very capable. And alongside that, there are a number of other things happening. Uh, Philip Yuan and I are, are publishing, are launching a journal um, uh, called Architectural Intelligence that will, that will be the first issue, which comes out in, in, um, in June of this year. And we've also been hosting a series of, um, of sessions on the new emerging theory of intelligence that is, is, that's coming out to the interface between AI, neuroscience, and architecture. Um, on Sundays, and if you're interested, there is at the bottom here, you can see the link to all the recordings. Something new and something very special is happening in terms of theoretical circles. Having said all that, the, the, the third um, area in which I think there have been developments is many ways, I think the most important, and that is to say the world of design itself. And I'm showing you a project that many of you will know already, Deep Himmelblau, that won um, a series of major awards in 2021 including uh, the Digital Futures Award and the Acadia Award. Um, I wanted to, well, to suggest today there is a new kid on the block and there's something even more astonishing that is about to happen. Um, so I wonder what I mean by the Sputnik moment. Let me go back to 1997. Uh, and there was a series of very high profile public events that um, brought the capabilities of AI to the public attention. Uh, in 1997, um, uh, an event that had been predicted by Ray Kurzweil, an event that uh, had been predicted that would happen before the year 2000, um, the world chess champion would be beaten by AI, indeed happened. Gary Kasparov was comprehensively beaten by IBM's Deep Blue. What I find significant, perhaps, is the comment that he said that he made after the match, everything we know how to do, machines will do better. This was the first of a series of events, the second one uh, being uh, at IBM Watson taking on the two human, the best human competitors at Jeopardy, and as we can see, thrashing them. Um, uh, Ken Jen Jennings made a comment uh, 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 on the final, the, the final part of the match, I for one welcome our new computer overlords, a reference to uh, a comment in The Simpsons. But the key issue that I want to talk about today was this particular event, a game of Go, a game that probably a match of Go a, that probably means very little to us, to those of us in the West, because Go is not a match that we play very often. It's not a game that we play very often, but one that had huge consequences in, in Asia, where uh, particularly in China and Korea, where Go is a, a national game. And this was a match that took place between AlphaGo, um, a system developed by uh, DeepMind in London, and Lisa Doll, one of the world's greatest ever Go players. Um, and it took place in Seoul, Korea in 2016, and everybody was expecting Lisa Doll to, um, to beat AlphaGo. Not least because the game of Go, although simple in terms of the moves, is infinitely complex, complicated in terms of the potential moves. There are more potential moves in Go than there are atoms on the, in the universe. And in order to address this, they had to move beyond the expert systems that were used for DeepMind to develop learning systems that they were able to address this. Uh, what was so interesting about this particular match was not the fact that Lisa Doll lost, and he lost 4-1, but it was the way in which Lisa Doll lost. Um, because there were certain moments in the game where AI was able to operate at a level 
totally beyond human comprehension. And famously, this particular move in game two, move 37, has gone down in history as being the most, um, the most uh, 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 significant moment in the history of AI. It wasn't the only moment. There are a series of other moments in, the, in, these, in this uh, match, a series of what they call slack moves, where AI was, where, where DeepMind was playing, AlphaGo was playing moves that nobody could at first understand and indeed thought were mistakes initially, glitches in the program, but actually proved to be strategically brilliant. Um, this is move 37, um, where, this, where uh, AlphaGo puts this black stone here, very unusual because it's on the fifth line, and normally in the beginning of a game, you have the third or the fourth line, but it put the stone here, and 100 moves later, these two black stones managed to kind of forge a link between this and win the match. Um, most human players operate through intuition and operate just simply one move ahead. Potentially, AlphaGo was operating 100 moves ahead in this particular match. Um, and this, this led to complete shock. Um, it, uh, as Lisa Dahl comments, yesterday I was surprised, but today I am speechless following that particular uh, moving game, game two. Um, and he came uh, at the end of the match itself, he came, came, to, came to the conclusion AlphaGo showed us that moves human, humans may have thought are creative were actually conventional. Uh, uh, human beings, in other words, were being left behind by AlphaGo, by AI. In 2019, three years after the match, Lee Sedol retired from the game of Go, commenting, this is an entity that cannot be defeated. Does that perhaps offer some presage to what's, to what's going to happen to the world of architecture? So the Sputnik no moment. Um, here, of course, uh, I'm, I'm referring um, to the original Sputnik moment um, in 1957, when the Russians launched the Sputnik um, satellite into space, shocking the Americans. And uh, it was a kind of wake up call. This is what led to the foundation of NASA and ultimately led to um, Apollo 11, to the Americans um, putting human beings on the moon. But it was this particular Sputnik moment that changed, as it were, the whole sort of um, the space race. Kai-Fu Li in his book, AI Superpowers, China, Silicon Valley and the New World Order, uses the term Sputnik moment to talk about the shock that this particular match, AlphaGo, um, had on particularly on China and, and the rest of Asia. Um, a, just over a year and a half after the match, President Xi, as a result of this match, announced his plan to invest in AI with the idea of somehow China overtaking America. And I would say that probably that is they're well on their way to doing that at the moment. And it wasn't simply China that was kind of had this wake up call. This, this, uh, I think the, the AlphaGo shock rippled throughout the world and especially in Korea um, where the match itself took place, um, where they also, as a result of the, of the impact of the match, began to invest heavily in AI. And in many ways, the rest is history because the race is on to try and to compete to be the world superpower in terms of AI. What I think was the important message here is that there's the, the human perception that somehow uh, machines could not do anything that was beyond human ability. Uh, the kind of comment that's made by Jack Ma, I never in my life say human beings will be controlled by machines. It's impossible. Human beings can never create another thing that is smarter than, than human beings. That it's obviously wrong, as Elon Musk points out. People under, underestimate the capability of AI. They sort of think that it's like a smart human, but it's going to be much smarter than the smartest human you will ever know. Um, the biggest mistake I see people making is to assume that they're smart. And what I want to kind of comment in some ways is that, that what we are beginning to understand, that there is a spectrum in terms of, of of let's say intelligence, um, just as a dog has a greater capacity to smell or hear than human beings, I would claim that AI has a certain strategic ability to go way beyond what human beings can conceive. Um, this this idea that we don't know how dumb we are, uh, the dumb don't know how dumb they are, is of course known as the Dunning-Kruger effect. I would want to suggest that maybe we need to extend that um, to say that the intelligent don't know how dumb they are, or indeed that the creative do not know how uncreative they are. We are ineffectively, we are effectively being shown up um, by the capabilities of AI. This I refer to as the second Copernican revolution, just as Copernicus had pointed out that the universe does not revolve around the earth. So I would argue that the universe today does not re revolve around human intellect, there are other forms of intelligence that we have to recognize that go way beyond us. If the human race dies out today, uh, the, the universe will continue without us. 
I want to then to point, give you some illustrations about what is actually happening in terms of uh, the use of AI in the ordinary office. This is nothing spectacular in terms of its architecture, but what is interesting are the observations that have been made about the use uh, of SpaceMaker AI. One of the software has been developed um, uh, for use in the architectural office. Um, uh, SpaceMaker has recently been acquired by Autodesk um, for 240 million. Clearly, this is the, what Autodesk think is going to be the way forward. Now, if you look at this architecture, you might not think it's so special, and indeed it is fairly conventional in, in some senses. Um, but what is interesting are the observations that came up. Um, this is Harvard Hochland, the CEO of SpaceMaker AI, where he was commenting that basically a bit like AlphaGo, where AlphaGo was able to operate at a level that we couldn't comprehend, so often SpaceMaker was able to come up with seduce, solutions, suggestions um, for urban planning proposals that were beyond those which humans had thought about. All the human experts weren't able to think, conceive of what AI could do. It was able to operate beyond the level of human abilities. Um, and that meant, for example, certain sort of counterintuitive solutions coming up with that really uh, changed the rules of um, planning just as AlphaGo changed the rules of Go itself. But the most important comment, I think, that uh, came out of this uh, of, of this discussion, and I think also out of my, my recently published book, is the point that that, that developers uh, are asking, or clients are asking, are insisting that architects use AI. And why are they asking for that? They're asking for that for that because because AI is able to guarantee their return on investment. They're able to maximize the profit in their uh, on their site and in the performance of the building itself. Clearly. AI is something that clients are, are very keen to have. I want to introduce uh, the, um, Wan Yu He, one of my uh, Doctor of Design students, or one of our Doctor of Design students at, at Florida International University and the CEO of XCool. Um, XCool uh, is a company uh, that was set up in 2016, um, the same year as, as AlphaGo, and it was highly influenced by the AlphaGo um, uh, situation. Uh, Wan Yu herself used to work for OMA, um, X Cool here refers to X Cool Haas, X O O M A. Uh, it also refers to the Urban Dictionary, the term super cool. Um, when you herself was more influenced actually by the next generation of AlphaGo, which is say AlphaGo Zero, um, a, a far superior system that not only was able to beat AlphaGo, the original model, 100 games to zero, but was able to teach itself to play Go. It was able to teach itself to play Go by playing, but through reinforcement learning, by playing 3.9 million games of Go over three days, effectively 20 games of Go per second, something we are even we simply cannot comprehend. And what what XCool have been doing, exploring um, over the years, is the potential of using this uh, um, platform largely for developer architecture. This is a um, uh, a, a project they did a while back um, uh, based on style gans. This building does not exist. Um, and it's part of, I guess, a series of, 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 of interventions that they've been making over the years. More recently, this is something that we published in the AD, um, uh, Machine Hallucinations of their more recent sort of work. Um, but most people have not been paying much attention to XCool precisely because uh, these are fairly conventional, straightforward rectilinear buildings. And most of their work they do is for developers. So why do we pay attention to that? Typically, according to uh, um, Rem Kohlhaas, architects have been uh, looking through a microscope, microscope at, the, kind of the, the, at a footnote within the history of architecture. And I think we need to pay attention to what's going on. But what really makes us stand up, it's, it makes uh, this whole thing stand out, is when is when uh, we, we find XCool producing a project that is in many ways a, a kind of progressive architectural project. And I want to share with you today, um, as a way of fine, wrapping up my, my presentation, um, a project that they recently, um, a competition entry they put in for, for a, um, a building, an environmentally sustainable building um, that was uh, produced in China. It, it, it was an inter, an, a Chinese competition, but they beat 200 other competitors. If you look at this block on the right, right hand side, here, you can see how it's, the rectilinear project is itself being broken down and what emerges out of this process is based on, on, on thermal comfort, this particular um, uh, part of the project. What emerges is a form of architecture that actually looks much more like Frank Gehry than it does the kind of standard uh, developer architecture that we've been seeing coming out of XCool. So here we are, this to kind of top, I think it's a form of topolog topological optimization process whereby these forms are emerging. 
Now, the project I can't show you, but I wish I could show you, is the next step, which is a competition entry on an international competition where uh, XCool is competing against, let's say, just two of the top 10 practices in the world. I've seen the project uh, and I'm blown away by it. I'm not allowed to show it. It's not this one I'm showing now. This is the same one I was before. But something is emerging and we will soon very, see very shortly uh, on an international scale um, what is happening and what can come out from this, this kind of techniques. There is then, I want to suggest, this is, this is the point, this is the point, the, 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 the Sputnik moment when the architectural profession wakes up and pays attention to what is happening in AI. It takes, just as it took uh, 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 AlphaGo to play against the world's uh, best Go player to really bring home the potential of AI to, to, to people living in China and in Korea, so to the architectural community, it will take uh, AI competing with the best architects in the world and potentially beating them um, to really bring home the potential of what AI can do. There are many aspects to this particular project that I won't go into now, but there was, for example, the paneling system, which they, uh, tessellation of the paneling system, which they they consulted an, a, a human expert on how to reduce the number of, of, um, of primitives, as it were. Um, and and they, they in the end, they had to go to AI. They had a, initially a thousand different sort of sizes of these, uh, of these, these panels, and then, the human expert reduced them down to 120 or so, and they used AI to get down to 12. So all these kind of throughout this particular project, AI has been used as a way of generating the design. It is a project that, as I understand, is completely based on the logic of AI. What I'm showing you there from a personal perspective, nothing near as astonishing as the project I can't show you. And I'm looking forward to the moment when we can see that one, because it seems to me that what we're encountering is the moment when precisely the moment when when people pay attention to what the potential of AI can be. One comment that I knew made when she showed me the other project, which I can't show you, was that she was terrified of showing it to people. She was terrified of showing it to people because she felt that people would, would, would begin to perceive that AI could effectively take all our jobs away. And that, in a sense, is the whole project behind my second book, The Death of the Architect. And that's pointing out that really, we are at threat of, of, um, of AI because it's able to operate at a level way beyond uh, human, uh, uh, human, human um, abilities. So what I'm suggesting then is if you look through the kind of the history of AI and the history over the years, going back even to the Sputnik moment in 57, there are certain crucial moments when we've certainly come, we've become aware of these capabilities. 1997, DeepMind beating Gary Kasparov, 2011, winning at Jeopardy. 2016 um, uh, with uh, uh, AlphaGo beating Lisa Doll. 2021 with extraordinary work of Deep Himmelblau um, by, by Daniel Bolojan and the, the Corp Himmelblau team. And I want to suggest that by 2022, we are suddenly going to realize that the, the, the real abilities of what AI can do because the architectural community will wake up to them. It's not that this work hasn't been going on for some time, but it takes a high profile moment, as it were, a kind of Sputnik moment to really bring this home to the architectural community. So this is what I, this is the presentation I want to make today. I think that we are about to see something quite astonishing happening um, in the world of architecture, something that is going to be a game changer, um, that is going to be, um, in a sense, learning from AlphaGo. 50 years ago today, a very famous book was published um, in 1972, learning from Las Vegas. This book, I mean, I don't know why people read this book, but it's a very popular book. 2022 is 50 years after the publication of this book. Um, there'll be a second book hopefully coming out called Learning from AlphaGo. My, uh, my view is, is that AI is going to change the world of architecture in a far more significant way than, Alf, than, than Las Vegas ever, ever could. Uh, my view then, uh, my, uh, my prediction, as it were, is that 2022, and especially the first half of 2022, is going to be the, the as it were, the, the Sputnik moment for architecture, when we can see um, precisely the capabilities of this thing. And the fact that these things are also uh, generated to think about the environment is part of that whole sort of process. So uh, thank you for listening. That's my presentation for today.